So the focus that we've been looking at overall has been the name of Jesus. The power of the name of Jesus. All the songs we sang today about the name, the great name. So there's a reason why they keep re reiterating the name of Jesus. If you think about this in the Old Testament, God's name was revealed in Exodus chapter 3, verses 14, 13 through 15. Yahweh or Yahweh or Yahweh, depending on how, where you're from in Israel, your intonation and, your, and how you pronounce things, north, south, kind of like they are here. My name is Andy or Andrew. But you go to some other like Latin-based country, it'd be Andre or Andres. So it doesn't matter about the name; it's who the name relates to. Okay. So we're saying Jesus, but in Hebrew it'd probably be Yeshua, Yeshua or Yehoshua. Again, north, south, or Yahshua. They, you know. So, but it means that name points to a person. It relates and resonates about the person that we're talking about. <laughs> So Yahweh, I am, or really Yahweh, when we say Yahweh or Jehovah or the Lord, when we say that name, it, we're really saying the eternal one. We're saying that from our standpoint to him. When he declares himself, he says, I am that I am, or I always was, I always am, and I always will be. But it's more than that. I will be Put the blank there. I will be your salvation. I will be your healer. I am your healer. I always was, you know. So all of those names, like I am the good shepherd. I am the shepherd. I am the healer. Yahweh Tzidkenu. I am your righteousness. And so forth. All of those names, the cognitive names, those combination names. Well, one name is Yahweh Hoshua or Hoshea or Yahoshua. So you get the com combination, and that's where you get Yeshua or Jesus. So that's why the name is glorified, because it's only through the name. When we understand who he is and what he, he's done for us, all that encapsulation, including his righteousness, his holiness, everything, because then that means we're sinners, right? So he is our salvation, so when we look at God, we say God is our Savior, God is our salvation. So this is this is an intro to why they really harp on this. Because when we profane the name, that does obscure the name, tie the name of Jesus to something that is pagan, tie the name of Jesus to something that's worldly, tie the name of Jesus to something that is just mundane, then, then me... In my old sinful mind, I can come along and say, well, he's just normal. He's just a prophet. He's just, do you see? See how tricky that is? So if you malign the name of Jesus, you malign what the message is about who he is and what he is and what he's come for. And so that's why they want to make sure they stood up for Christ in this. So we're going to go over a, a little bit of chapter 3 into 4 and, and see how a little bit of review. God's miracle of healing, of healing this man who was lame from birth, led to the presentation of the gospel. The gospel was presented. Again, I always say, all the miracles of Christ attest to or point to or signs of Christ. We're not just, God, give me a miracle so that I'm comfortable, so that I can pay my mortgage, so that... That's a very limited scope of the way we think. It should be, God, heal me so that I can spread the gospel. God, heal me so that others are saved. God, use this to confirm your word, and so forth. Not just so that God can get me out of the foxhole. You know, foxhole prayer, you know. God, you know, I'll serve you if you do this or whatever. So that's what this miracle was. And all the miracles point to Jesus because in him is our salvation. There is no other name, no other one that, that we can look to for salvation. Now, <clears throat> this is true. No matter how powerful these irrefutable, undeniable miracles are to confirm God's word, it can still lead to persecution. And we know this throughout history. 
And we, and we have this recorded in chapter 3 and 4. No matter what, you're going to be called to task. When God is doing something through you, um, you might have some flack from the enemy. It might take a while for him to catch up. He might be on his heels, like I was saying. Like the day of Pentecost, Satan and all his, his armies were kind of on their heels and didn't know what to do about this. This is crazy, you know, that this powerful work of God would be in man. And so it took them a while. But they re recouped and got their troops back together. And, and so persecution occurred. And so Peter and John are drawn, that is, dragged. <laughs> They're like leaped upon and dragged before the court, put in jail. So they're putting them in jail. It's kind of like being brought before the principal's office. But you might have done something wrong. So yeah, you should be, <laughs> should be fearing <laughs> a little bit. I don't know about today though. What are they? What can they do? Um, you can't be on Facebook or something. But ba back then, we my my mom said, well, yes, you can use the yardstick or the paddle. You know, I'm not on flesh, but you know, on the rear. And just the threat of that was enough to, well, most of the time keep me in line. <laughs> and for a lot of us, we had that. So persecution. Now this is th this goes to all persecution. There's roots for why. There's a reason why. The old sinful flesh, Satan fanning the flames of the old sinful flesh in humans, there's a reason why. And the reason is that when the gospel comes <clears throat> to sinful people and those people embrace and hold on to Christ, Jesus said in John 8, 31 through 36, If you abide in my word, you shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. So you're no longer under their control, under the control of the powers that be. And those who are who are in the powers that be, they feed off, they enjoy, they get benefits from this control. Satan gives those guys goodies to keep everybody, and everybody else who's under control, uh, candy or whatever, just to keep them there. He doesn't want their lives to be messed up. He likes to make them comfortable. You see, it's only God that comes and messes up your life and shakes up your life so that you can realize you're a sinner. Satan doesn't want you to realize that there's death looming, doesn't want you to realize that you're a sinner, doesn't want you to even think that you're outside of God's will. You're okay. You see, that's where Satan wants us to be. And so as long as you just keep in line and keep your mouth shut and do these things, you'll have these benefits. Well, in their case, it was... The, the, the Sadducees were greatly disturbed that they taught, that is, the disciples taught and preached in Jesus the resurrection of the dead, in his name. In Jesus' name, the resurrection of the dead. We, we, we talked about that last week, that the Pharisee, I mean, the Sadducees do not like the idea of the resurrection. They don't know about angels and all that. They stick with the first five books. Problem is, Demons are mentioned. Angels are mentioned. <laughs> I mean, I don't know how you get around that, even resurrection. So, I mean, they, they have to uh, ignore some things. But that tells you where they're coming from. And instead of all that, in spite of all that, despite of all that, Peter and John kept preaching, knowing this. They did not cower. They did not back down. And so that's that should bring us courage. Today, there are all kinds of things that are hot buttons out there that the world wants us to shut up about. Instead of that, listen to Jesus, obey him, and preach the word. All those scriptures that are on your, on your notes there, you can follow up and look through and, and see how Jesus said, even if I speak to you in the dark and whisper in your ears, say it out loud in the light. Or if I, I say it, over here in the hidden place, speak it out or preach it out on the rooftops. So there's something about speaking it out, telling it, and, and don't be silent. Don't let the enemy shut you up. And that's what the enemy wants to do. So here's the, the intimidation or, or the first part, the investigation. Look, you guys have been preaching we're going to put you in jail and let you stew a little. See, for most folks, that
that'd be enough to shut them up. For most folks, whoa, the threat. See, the big wigs, what do they want to do? They want to keep their power. They like it. They like everything, the goodies they, they get from it. But again, even despite, in spite of the undeniable miracle, they were not persuaded by it. Now, a lot of people were in the temple, right? Either 2,000 or 5,000, depending on how you read that. But that's a lot of people that were persuaded by that man leaping up and, and jumping around and praising God. And what did the apostles do? They pointed to Jesus, and then they preached the gospel. They used the Old Testament because they didn't have the New Testament. They are the New Testament. They are the living new covenant. So they pointed to Old Testament prophecies. It was undeniable. They connected God. They connected Jesus. They connected the, the scriptures to everything that happened to them. And they pointed to Christ. But these, these power-hungry people using the government's power, and you'll see that. Satan uses governmental power of some sort, local government all the way to the, the top of the country or worldwide UN power, whatever. He is going to, he, that's how he can do it because he doesn't have all the troops, but he's slick and he's persuasive. But let's see what happens here. The investigation. Well, the investigation is geared to silence. So anytime Satan does something through human beings to stop us from preaching the gospel, it is to shut us up. It's to silence us. And that would be enough to silence most folks. But for some reason, these two fishermen that have no background with this, they kept going. Now think about it. They had been with Jesus for three and a half years, almost four years. Think about that. They had been with him. Jesus said, I choose, I'm choose. i going to choose these. I'm going to pray all night so that they may be with me. You know, someone tells a lie about your friend, your best friend that you grew up with, that you, you're still friends with, let's say. And they bring him to court and say, well, he stole this whatever, Snickers bar or something, whatever it is. It's like, no way is that him. There's no way that was him. So they finally review the tape, and it, it, it's like some guy who looks like him. But the reason why you stick up for him is because you know that person. He's your best friend, someone you know. Well, that's the way it is with these disciples, these apostles. They know him. Not about him, but they know him. That is deep. And then... The Holy Spirit, the very essence of Jesus, so to speak, the personal closeness of Jesus by the Holy Spirit. Not only do I know him, he is with me. And what are they going to do? They're going to stand up for him. But let me show you how Satan's tactics are. It says they threatened him. It says they threatened them both. But it didn't say what they did or how they did it. But we know how Satan's schemes are. He uses a multi, multi-pronged approach to folks. So he'll use one or two or the combination. So he'll let's just use intimidation. Just that. What that sometimes is, is the fear of the unknown of unknown harms. That is, you don't know what's coming, but these fear tactics are used to intimidate you. The intimidation is to shut you up, is to quiet you down, is to make you to cower. And, and that's kind of a general tactic, intimidation. And it's usually verbal, and it's some sort of threat. Well, the next one is social relational threats. That is your, your social status, relationships. You, um, in some cults, if you're a part of a cult, they would use that you are no longer can associate with your husband, your wife, your children. They're going to take your children away. There are... Uh, other ways of, of intimidation so that they would turn your relations against you, even though they know you. Um, the next one is economic threats. You're going to lose your job. You know you got your job because of the friendships of this religion that you just joined, and now you're not going to have it anymore. 
you know, cousin so-and-so in the synagogue, he got you that job. And now, sorry, you're going to lose that. So do you really want to lose your house and your mortgage? You know your whole family. You can hear this echo of the whole line of thinking of how the enemy will use that. Very wise, very slick. It's quiet sometimes in the back room. You know, I might have to tell the others. And then, so in many cases, that's what will stop people and quiet them. Another one is uh, physical threats. We're going to hit you. We're going to beat you. In fact, they might beat you a little bit, but we're going to beat you more next time. Or maybe even death, the fear of death. Read Hebrews chapter 2 and how Satan uses the fear of death over people to control them. But those who are in Christ have been set free from that fear, the fear of death. That his, that's his last straw because really to unbody you, to kill you, is all he can do to us. Because then we're, we're in heaven, right? For us, it's victory. It's graduation day. But for the unbeliever, the, the fear of judgment is looming or the fear of whatever I might not exist anymore or whatever it is. So the, the, the investigation was to silence them, to intimidate them, to shut them down. But the glorious thing about it is this. But Peter and John reply, which is right in God's eyes, to listen to you or to him? You be the judges. And for us, we cannot help Speaking cannot help speaking about what we have seen and heard. So they, they just can't help but speak. Listen to some of the verses here uh, that relate to their response. See, they came right in, in verse 7. It says, by what power or by what name have you done this? And in verse 8, then Peter, having just been filled... That's really what the Greek is. Having just been filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, rulers of the people and elders of Israel, if we this day are judged or being judged for a good deed done to a helpless man, that should have just shut them down already. We just did something good to somebody. Why do you care? Right? By what means he has been made well, let it be known to you all. See, I told you they're from the South. Y'all. To all the people of Israel, that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him this man stands before you whole. This is the stone which was rejected by you builders, which has become the chief cornerstone. Nor is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved." And so they were bold, bold, bold about what had happened. So let me, let me go through how their response was, the quality of their response. The, the, the abil- not just the ability, but how it came across. First, it was powerful, having just been filled with the Holy Spirit. I remember when I was um, first in Christ, they said you had to be filled with the Holy Spirit. So I thought, well, I need to go up forward and have this thing. And then I started reading the Bible and actually starting to learn Greek and such. And I'm like, well, which one is this one? Having just been filled. I want that one because look how bold he was. And it went on. Well, I find out that if you go to Ephesians 5, 18 through 20, 21, it talks about be filled. Well, it really means be continually filled with the Holy Spirit. Keep getting filled with the Holy Spirit. You know why? Because in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, it says we're jars of clay. That is, we leak. God pours out through us, and we leak. Now, of course, Holy Spirit is not liquid or gas. These are symbolic language uses. But what happens is we need to be refilled with God's Spirit. We need to resurrender. We need to refocus. We need to allow the Holy Spirit to have hold of us. So evidently, he had been praying. He had been really in tune with God, and this is having just been filled. So he was endued, empowered with the power of the Holy Spirit. And the words to be able to say what he said, 
But you see, all of that which was in him and what he spoke was that which he's read in Scripture and had experienced with Christ personally. So you just can't have something that the Holy Spirit doesn't grab a hold of and bring up if it isn't in you. So that's why I always say, get the scriptures in you. Get the word of God in you. Spend time with Jesus. Have experiences, shared experiences with Jesus. Those are the things you remember. Shared experiences with your family. Shared experiences with friends are those that you remember. I mean, even playing games, you know, those dominoes with all those dots on them or whatever. Those are shared experiences. And so what shared experiences do you have with Jesus? Think about that. So they were powerful in the Holy Spirit powerful. And then they were bold. They were strong, courageous, steadfast, regardless of the pressure of compromise. And if you go down to uh, verse 19, verse 19, he says, but Peter and John answered and said to them, whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you more than God you judge, for we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard so, so these disciples were courageous. They were strong and courageous. They were also, also articulate. Now, being bold, strong, and courageous is one thing. And there are folks out there that are strong and courageous, but they wouldn't be called articulate. If you go back up to verse 13, you see what they say. That is what the Sadducees say. Now, when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated and untrained, they marveled. Now, it wasn't just the boldness, but it was, why why would they even bring up uneducated? Why would they even bring up untrained? Because they saw the boldness and the ability of being verbose and articulate in what they were speaking. Now, We will lay that at the feet of Jesus by the Holy Spirit. We would, because we know the background of these guys. So it has to be miraculous. But nonetheless, it isn't just boldness only. It's the ability to to be articulate, bring forth the word, and bring it forth in such a way that they do understand. And they did. That didn't mean that they were persuaded and, and going to surrender to it, but they were... Uh, they, they were marveling at that. It was factual. There's a few facts going on. One is this man. They mentioned it three times in here. Those Sadducees in the investigation, they mentioned it. This is an undeniable fact. It's evident. They use the word evident, which means evidence, facts, proofs, evidence that you would use legally in front of a court. I mean, they use these words and they go... But what are we supposed to do about it? It's like, well, you should have repented. That's what you're supposed to do. I mean, that's what Peter and John were seeking to even persuade them. Think about it. They were these big wigs. These are guys that you should cower about. I mean, these are guys that can put you away forever or kill you. Boy, they, they just delivered Jesus over to Pilate and what happened to him. So whew, that could happen. Or they could threaten my family. Think of all the things that might be going through those guys, through Peter and John. They could they could torture my kids in front of me. I mean, there's nothing that would stop these guys. They're so power hungry. But yet, there was this evidence in front of them. Factual. Another one. Hey, you guys were the instigators, like I just said, that delivered Jesus to Pilate and then persuaded folks to say, crucify him, crucify him. The pressure was on, the intimidation. These guys are I mean, artisans in this, they are slick in being able to get masses of people to go their way. Well, they're not following the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, so hmm, you wonder who's behind that, right? They weren't, you know, in God. So, And then they're persuasive. They were persuasive. Now, they were persuasive in the temple, right? And they were seeking to be persuasive there. You, You read this, and of course, for us, in Christ, it's persuasive to us. We would look at this and say, yes, of course. The logic is is undeniable. And plus, this miracle is undeniable. So they were persuasive. So they are powerful, bold, articulate, factual, and persuasive. And this is the hallmark of the church as it should be. When you go through history, 
you will find from the church, that is, I'm talking the real church, the body of Christ. They have this throughout history. Nobody else, the pagans don't have this. I mean, all those pagan religions are gone, except a few. India, maybe. You know, but what I'm saying is, you have these other pagan religions. They weren't bold and, and persuasive and articulate. They were a little bit, but they didn't last. There was something of a hallmark. Think about the literature that has been written by the church. Think of all the ancient manuscripts that have been pre preserved. Think of, think of the history of the church in, in making sure that, that we have knowledge of the past. If it wasn't for the church, even some of the ancient pagan stuff wouldn't be there. I mean, they just let them go because there weren't any followers of them anymore. Isn't that amazing? So think of the church as being God's preservation, but also his voice. We are his voice. We are his voice. Bold, powerful, bold, articulate, factual, persuasive. Let's pray that the church gets back to this in the power of the Holy Spirit. When we are like that, people come to Christ. Even after this, people come to Christ. Even after this persecution. This persecution led to more people coming to Christ. It's a gospel sandwich. Starts with the gospel, ends with the gospel. In between the healing and, and persecution. And, and, it, and it continues on. So that's the way it should be. Satan, in, Satan intended for this to shut them up. It did not. It did not shut them up. And then finally we look at the response of the community of the faith. Community of faith, the church. The response is twofold. Prayer and preaching. So prayer, what did they do in their recalling of in their prayer? Well, the very first thing is, Lord, you are God. They recalled God himself. His power, his glory, and his might. His promises. And then they compared the threats of these people. Here are their threats. And then they talk about God's faithfulness. So it says this. It says, Lord, you are God who made heaven and earth and the sea and all that is in them, who by the mouth of your servant, servant David has said, why do the nations rage and the people's plot vain things. The kings of the earth took their stand and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his Christ, Psalm 2. You can go to Psalm 2 and read that. That was prophesied. All this is prophesied. And it's a twofold. It's going to happen again during the tribulation. So what did they do? They recalled. First thing they had to do is recall God. When you're facing a threat of persecution, when you're facing the threat, when you're facing any kind of challenge, the first thing we need to do is recall God in our minds, in our hearts, and, and recall who he is, what he is. What is he? He is God. Who is he? He is the personal Yahweh God, the one with his name that, that has all his faithfulness to Israel. All that faithfulness. He is faithful. He has made promises. He even knew this. This was not a, this was not a surprise. Challenges that we face are not a surprise. But notice this is gospel focused. So they, they first recall. Then the next thing they did is petition. The next thing they did is petition. Let's not just stay there so that I can be comfortable. Let's not just stay here so that I can feel good and everything's okay and I, I, I can just kick back. The next thing was call to action. They're asking God to make them bold and empowered by the example that they just saw with Peter and John, who were bold before those enemies, so to speak, the enemies of the gospel. And that boldness uh, is for them and for God to do con confirming, to confirm his word. See, we can't confirm God's word. We can get as much evidence. We can give facts, proofs. We can present the gospel. We can even be persuasive. But it's God who confirms his word and then by the Holy Spirit convicts them, convinces them in their heart. So they didn't just stay there in prayer, though. The next thing they did was God filled them with the Spirit because that's an answer to prayer. And they went out and spoke in tongues. No, it didn't. No. What did they do? 
They were filled with the Spirit with the evidence of speaking the Word of God in the power of the Word of God. And it's amazing how they pray. They, they said in verse, um, verse 29, Now, Lord, look upon their threats and grant to your servants that with all boldness they, or we, may speak your word. And then, by stretching out your hand to heal, that signs and wonders may be done through the name of your holy servant, Jesus, the name. And when they had prayed, the place where they assembled together was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and they went out and had pie. What happened? And they spoke the word of God with boldness. Didn't say how they did it. They just went out and did it. They, they figured it out, and they went out and did it. And so they were, they were filled with God's Spirit. So their part was to ask God, and here we have an example of prayer, something that we can pray, similar to how Jesus said to his disciples, pray to the Lord of the harvest that he would send out laborers to the harvest. We have these prayers that we know, hey, this is something I can pray. And so praying for God to give you boldness by his spirit, the word of God, to speak the word of God, while we rely upon God to confirm the word that we're preaching. See, if we go out and we're not preaching the word, what's he going to confirm? So we have to do our part, what our part is. And we're doing it in the power of the Spirit. We want to be led by the Spirit. We want God. We're seeking him. God, fill us with your Spirit so that we can preach your word powerfully, boldly, factually, with articulation, articulate, and persuasive. We want to be able to do that. And for God to, it didn't say uh, only the apostles did this. It says they all. That's about be either 4,000, 5,000, or 8,000 people. Wow, they took over. They went out and preached the word. It's amazing. And so by example, the leaders did it. And then the people did it. And no one shut up. That which... Satan intended for bad. God intended for good. Turn that around. So when Satan pressures you to be quiet, when Satan pressures you, go beyond that. Pray to God. Seek God. Get your mind on God, who he is. And then pray for God to give you boldness, wisdom, gentleness, not being boisterous, and, and being able to go out and preach the gospel and proclaim it. That is our part. Relying upon God to confirm his word. Let him do that part. But it says they were praying for God to do it. God, confirm your word as you stretch out your hand to heal with signs, wonders, and miracles in the name of Jesus. There is nothing in the Bible that says, no, you can't pray that anymore. Oh my, we need to pray that all the time. We need God to, in their lives, those people that we've shared the gospel to, we need to be praying, God, confirm your word in their lives. Show it what I was talking to them about, that that's real. Amen? We, we, have, the, we have the right, and we should. this should be our duty to pray this way and to be this way. Amen? So this year, 2017, may it be the year of the gospel, and may it be the year of God using us to bring others to Christ. Amen? Amen. So let's uh, let's think about the name of Jesus. It's all about the name of Jesus. Amen? All about Jesus. He is 